As you know, Fight Impunity is an organization working on impunity and transitional justice issues, doing analysis and advocacy on issues related to impunity and traditional justice all over the world. I would like to uh, introduce all the speakers now, and then uh, we, will, uh, we will be able to move on with the conference. We have Farid Abahi, who is a, a, a journalist and lecturer in politics, also author of the book History of Yemen, which was published this year in July, and which is only the last one of a series of books that you have been publishing, Farian, on the Middle East, on Caucasus, and on Central Asia, which is, you know, the, the, the areas. Perfect. This is the, the book that you're showing to us. Thank you very much. We have then Helen Lackner, who is a um, visiting fellow at the European Council for Foreign Relations and Research Associate at SOS University of London. Welcome, Helen. We can see you here. We have then two uh, the human rights activists and uh, in Yemeni human rights activists, Radial Mutawakel. Uh, chair of the Muatan Organization for Human Rights, and Huda Al Sarari, who is a Yemeni lawyer and activist, winner of the Martin and Nels Award in 2020. Thank you both of you for being here. And of course, apologies for not pronouncing your name perfectly. I probably pronounce them with a very Italian uh, pronunciation. Um, we then will conclude our uh, panel discussions with uh, Kamel Jean Duby, who has been chair of the UN Group of Eminent International and Regional Experts on Yemen, and Mark Tarabella, who is a member of the European Parliament, vice chair of the European Parliament's Delegation for Relations with the Arab Peninsula, member of the SD Group in the European Parliament. So it, the end at the end of the conference, we will have some concluding words from uh, Pier Antonio Panzeri, who is the chair of Fight Impunity and our organization today. So, um, as you can see, we have an excellent group of people that will discuss issues related to uh, impunity and transitional justice in Yemen. At the end, I will also um, include a number of recommendations uh, that Fight Impunity is doing to the European Union on the issues in, on the issue related to impunity in uh, Yemen. But first of all, I would like to launch the conference if everyone is connected and remember that you can follow the conference with the language that you prefer, English, French, Italian or Arabic. Um, and I would like to launch the conference by giving the floor already to Farian Sabahi and then Helen Lackner, who will uh, discuss the legacy of impunity in Yemen, will put us all in the same level of understanding of what has been happening in the last seven years in Yemen and how we have got to the situation where we are today um, of total impunity uh, in Yemen. So Farian Sabahi, the floor is yours, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Donatella, I thought I was going to talk uh, uh, in the last panel because the program you sent me, I was actually, uh, I have the program here and I'm supposed to speak at 3.40, if you don't mind. Okay. If because I would like, rather be like, you know, I've been uh, talking, uh, uh, I'm not saying on a daily basis about Yemen, but I'm, I can do an overview, but I rather prefer to talk after uh, the presentation of, uh, uh, of uh, the results of uh, your work. Okay, let, yeah. me, let me then start with Ellen, if yeah. Ellen, you would like to intervene. And then I, can, I will give the floor to Radia and Huda because they are Yemeni activists and they can help us a lot also in the understanding of the situation. And I will give you the floor after them, if this is okay. Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. Helen, the floor is yours then. 
Well, thank you very much for asking me. I'm sorry there's been some confusion about the program because I had understood that Farian would be speaking about the gender, general international aspects of the situation as an introduction, and I would speak about the more the internal aspects. Ellen, nobody told me. Sure. Nobody told me. I, I mean, the program I'm here. It's uh, set in a completely different way. So uh, probably I didn't get the final program. I just had. Uh, the, okay, no problem. Don't worry. I mean, if you want, I can do it. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm in Rome, and it was uh, raining so much. I just got home, and uh, don't and worry, Fabio. I mean, as you wish. I'll, uh, I'd be happy to listen to Ellen. And then yes, yes, I would suggest Helen, we will start with you, then we will give the floor to Radia and Huda, and then we will go back to Farian. Don't worry. I think in any case, all your intervention will help us to understand the context and to be all on the same level on the context. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I also want to point out that I'm very honored to be speaking alongside Radia and uh, Mr. Jandubi. Who've, both of whom I have enormous respect for your work. And I also look forward to hearing the other panelists. And I'm sure that I learn a lot about the EU role and other aspects in the situation. So what I have prepared because of what I discussed earlier with Simona is basically a very brief introduction to the situation in Yemen on the assumption that a number of the members of the participants won't necessarily be familiar with them. And given the very narrow time scale, I'm going to basically talk about two things very briefly. The first one is the fundamental causes of the conflict in general. And the second one is a very brief uh, piece on the war. Uh, when it comes to impunity and injustice, I just want to say, because Radia is far better qualified than I am to talk about it, that you know, there's been, there's been a history of injustice and impunity in Yemen since, since I've been involved in the country, which is now since 1973 or thereabouts. And, I don't, and there was a lot going on even before that. So it's not as if um, injustice and impunity are new events in Yemen. So now I'll come to what I was going to talk about. Basically, the fundamental causes of the conflict are there are four different types of fundamental causes which are prior to the war and which have continued during the war. The first one is the limited natural resources, in particular, the water scarcity and the very limited hydrocarbons, which means that when you're in a country with a population of 30 million, there's a very insufficient uh, sources of possible income. That's leaving aside the fact that much of what has been existence has been misused. But again, we don't have time to go into that. The second element has been the political paralysis and the autocracy, which prevailed for 30 years or more under Ali Abdallah Saleh, and which in a way was not interrupted and continued in, since then. So in particular, the Saleh regime operated a divide and rule policy. It also uh, monopolized benefits amongst a very small group of his friends and cronies. It, th this resulted in a very fundamental worsening gap between rich and poor. And finally, I think it's important to remember that Yemen had a, a kind of a democracy, although it had many faults, and it's by no means uh, the kind of democracy that most of us would appreciate. It was certainly much more than the farcical kind of performance that happened, for example, under Ben Ali in Tunisia. And there was a real opposition. It was never allowed to get any power, but it existed. And I think those are important aspects that affected the situation. Economically, during those uh, 30 years, we had... I consider it, from the view economic, of these years, these 30 years, non erano state imposte internazionalmente of the Saleh regime namely making sure that a small group of people were doing very well while the vast majority were doing very badly if you remember that 70% of Yemen's population is rural you know it's important to note that the the mismanagement and in particular the misuse of existing water 
had a very deleterious effect on agriculture and on the management of fisheries. In addition, the country suffered from a very low level of industrialization. So between these factors, you had a situation with very minimal income, very high levels of unemployment, and therefore a very fundamental economic crisis. And at the social level, you basically had a country with a very rapid population growth, which was doubling in 20 years and still almost does, and a very low level of skills. So if you think about when Yemen was unified in a single state in 1990, it had about 11 million people. Today, it has about 30 million people. The resources have not increased and the income has not increased, but the situation has obviously worsened. Now, to speak very briefly about the, the war, we have to look, the, you know, the, if you look at the origins of the war, these many fundamental factors that I've just mentioned had the impact of creating considerable divisions and things started becoming problematic after about 2000. So you had the rise of the Houthi movement in the far north with six wars between the Houthis and the Saleh regime between 2004 and 2010. And you also, after 2007, had the rise of the Southern separatist movement. Again, I don't think we have time to go into the details of that. And I've actually published a number of books on all these topics, which people are most welcome to read. And I've got two more books coming out later this year, sorry, early next year. And the third, this, the third element which really contributed to the explosion in 2011 was the stalemate in the parliament in 2009 when Saleh wanted to basically change the rules for the third or fourth time in order to be able to be uh, stand as president again, which officially he wasn't supposed to, and the parliament refused to cooperate with this. And also they wanted to have reforms on the electoral register. Again, I think these are points that Radia can probably talk about much better than I can. So basically the war which started in 2015, which is now, or it started in 2014 within Yemen, but with it, it became internationalized in 2015 with the coalition in <laughs> But that it is fundamentally a internal civil war, which has been much worsened by the international intervention, but it is fundamentally an internal Yemeni conflict. If we look at the situation today, again, you know, I don't think I've got time to go into more details. We're now in a situation where the Houthi movement is very much uh, in the in the ascendancy, they're doing extremely well, uh, despite very considerable losses and the deaths of many, many young people. Uh, but, you know, it's important to know that they are, that the likelihood at the moment is that they may well take Maghreb, which is the last stronghold, as everybody keeps repeating, of the internationally recognized government. And um, it is, you know, it will make a very, it will have a very fundamental impact if they do finally take it. One of the many reasons they are, the Houthis are doing so well is very much because the people opposing them, the anti-Houthi groups are extremely divided. And just to mention a few of them, we have the international recognized government, which does not represent very much and controls extremely little and are much, to some extent, or to a larger extent, supported by the Saudis. You have the Southern Transitional Council, which is actually a rival to the, to the internationally recognized government and, active, and acting against it in many ways. And that is supported by the United Arab Emirates. On the West Coast, along the Red Sea, you have the forces of uh, Ali Abdallah Saleh's nephew Tarek and various other forces. And then in other places, you have other groups, including some of the jihadi groups, but I think the jihadi groups are not of very fundamental importance in terms of what's happening in Yemen. And you have other groups. So very briefly, I think if we look at the prospects for peace, um, I think they're unfortunately still pretty dim. 
the situation has improved a little bit, I think, with the new UN Special Envoy, Hans Grunberg, who was previously the EU ambassador and has been involved with Yemen now for a number of years, so he knows what he's getting into. He's certainly being extremely active at the moment, traveling around at to great speed, including to places where no international, as far as I know, has been since the beginning of the war, for example, Taiz. Uh, and, um, you know, he is said to be preparing some new proposal, and I hope that he has some success. The situation is that the UN activity and therefore his are still constrained by the United Nations Security Council 2216, which effectively both recognizes officially by name Hadi as president and demands that the Houthis withdraw to where they were prior to 2014, something which is highly unlikely to happen given what they've been doing and where they've been getting since then. So I think we have to look, and there's also, you know, the, the current military situation clearly suggests that the Houthis aren't about to withdraw. Um, I think that what happens in the future is something that we could discuss. I don't know if there's going to be any time for questions and discussions, but I also have to tell people that I will actually probably not stay till the end of the meeting because I have to be somewhere and I'll have to leave at exactly 3.30 or maybe even a few minutes earlier, at least in our time here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, considering that you will be leaving before the, I was thinking of a Q&A session towards the end before, you know, after all the people had spoken, but maybe what we could do considering that you cannot stay until the end is that if there is a particular question addressed to Helen uh, in the next few minutes, please write it on the chat and then we will try to address the question to Helen before she has to leave. Thank you very much, Helen. This is an excellent way of putting us into the context. And I would like to leave the floor now to Radia and Huda because you are Yemeni activists and you work in Yemen and you work with Yemen human rights organizations and activists like you. So we would like to hear from you. What is the situation? Why, why it's so important to speak about impunity today? And uh, if you can, you know, explain to us what are the different uh, responsibilities and what is possible to do. What is your, also, what are your recommendations and what is your uh, advocacy work and message that you give? Radia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dantella. Thank you first for your work that encouraged this conference. Um, I'm glad to be with all of you today. Thank you, Helen, for your back, uh, uh, for the background you have given. I'm really glad to be with you at the same uh, uh, platform. Thank you for all, all the work you do, uh, and you're right. Uh, since you, you just give a very general uh, background, this will help me to go directly to the war uh, and to the violations and impunity and accountability. So one of the facts that I keep saying all the time that uh, Yemen doesn't have uh, to be the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, even among the war. It happened only because of the huge absence of accountability. So now in Yemen, there is this huge collapse of the state. Yemen is controlled, unfortunately, by different armed groups from Saada to Sukhadra. Uh, and all parties to the conflict, as the, um, the GEE said in their reports, uh, there are no clean hands. They are all involved in horrible violations and war crimes against civilians. And through our work that we do in the ground, we are a human rights NGO and we have field researchers all over Yemen. And one of the things that we are doing is documenting the violations by all parties to the conflict. We can see to what extent through all the years of war, there was a very preventable violations in, by all parties to the conflict. And in many incidents, the uh, civilians keep asking why we were targeted, while there is no even, even a military target or a military advantage. So it uh, has tried to prevent it because they don't care. 
uh, they trust impunity more than anything else. And Dontella, you said the legacy of impunity in Yemen. And I want to clarify that the legacy of impunity in Yemen is linked directly to the legacy of impunity internationally in the whole world. After documenting the violations for many years, we started to feel as a human rights NGO that to keep publishing about the human rights violations with not doing a concrete um, steps, serious towards a real accountability, criminal accountability, it will just normalize the violations. I would just get, help people to get used to it. And then nothing is happening in order to hold parties to the conflict accountable, or even to help uh, to protect civilians or to make the situation less miserable. So we in Muwatana started to try to see what is available internationally when it comes to accountability. Uh, we have we have did a lot of I mean like workshops with experts in the US and in Europe. And I will be very honest with you that we were surprised to know that the whole award is designed in a way that enhance impunity more than accountability. So, for example, if we want to use the ICC, so none of parties to the direct parties to the conflict has signed the room status. So we cannot go to uh, target, I mean, them uh, track them through the ICC and uh, to refer the Yemen situation uh, to the ICC through the Human Security Council is very political, very uh, complicated, although we keep asking for this. Also, we have tried to use the universal jurisdiction, but the main challenge was that there is no Yemeni diaspora in Europe, like uh, it's happening in Syria, for example. And the only uh, I mean, angle until now that we could use the uh, international available mechanisms for accountability was this through the angle of weapons. So we have filed a complaint, for example, in Italy. We submitted a communication to the ICC. Noi abbiamo inviato una, um, una comunicazione alla Corte uh, Penale Internazionale. E... Comment faire en sorte que cette responsabilité soit prise au niveau national, local, mais aussi international? Donc, on a eu vraiment l'impression. This can be changed, but it's very hard and it's very complicated and it needs a lot of work. So, through the Human Rights Council, um, the states with the, uh, the efforts of the civil society finally succeed in 2017 to have a kind of an international investigation, which is the GEE, the Group of Eminent Experts, and I'm glad that Mr. Kamal Jandoubi is with us now. Uh, in the last two reports of the GEE, they ask for a criminally focused investigative mechanism, something like triple IM, uh, like for Syria or Myanmar. So in the last session of, session of the Human Rights Council, we were asking to renew for the GEE, like this is something that is going to be happened by default as civil society. And we were asking to have a criminally focused investigative mechanism through the Human Rights Council. But what happened is that we lost the GEE and there is no criminally focused investigative mechanism. But this was not the but the end of the puzzle. And don't tell you ask what is our advocacy messages at this moment. And I was I say that we are now discussing with civil society and with state that there is something serious can be done through the General Assembly now. And it's very possible to have an investigative mechanism like Triple IM through the General Assembly, but we need champions like state who draft the resolution and to go forward for this uh, for this battle. Um, it's uh, like um, it's, it can be like European countries, it can be the US with their new approach towards Yemen, uh, but we are still pushing and trying to have this. And it's very sad that states need a very strong push to go forward, although it is very available, it is possible. But uh, as I keep saying that the war in Yemen is not forgotten, it is ignored. It is ignored for many reasons. And one reason is the financial interest uh, over uh, this war. Um, selling weapons is one, uh, one of them, but not everything. Uh, 
So um, in 2011, uh, uh, after the revolution happened in Yemen, uh, there was a political agreement. This political agreement has given Ali Abdullah Saleh, the ex-president, impunity. And the justification was in order to keep peace and to have peace. But what happened that this impunity, this this uh, this formula didn't work. This lie didn't work. Uh, the war started with more aggressive parties to the conflict. So like giving impunity to any party to the conflict uh, was saying that this will help peace. It's just like a big lie. Impunity, I mean, accountability will push for peace and then when maintain peace. And if the war started again in the in the future for any reason, at least parties to the conflict will not be that aggressive and they will do care and they would they know they will be held accountable if they didn't respect the international humanitarian law, the international law for human rights. So accountability here is a international accountability here is a, a big component and it can change the fact that Yemenis are living a miserable life and even if the war going is going on i hope it will stop with a sustainable peace but even if the war is still going on if we have a strong mechanisms of accountability this will help us to make the situation less miserable for civilians and thank you thank you radia this was uh, thank you for putting us in in you know in this understanding thank you for pointing also the responsibilities of the international community in making this an awful war especially for civilians and as you were saying and the importance yeah. of and the need for accountability which is the, the perpetrators all of them need to you know be held accountable for what they have been, uh, um, you know, for the horrible human rights violations. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to leave the floor to Huda Sari now. Um, thank you, Huda, for your intervention. Shukran Gazilan, Ashkor Fight Immunity, Ala Itahat Al Fursa Lihada Al Laka, Wa Al Tarif B. الجرائم والانتهاكات التي تحدث في اليمن. Les violations qui se passent au Yémen en tant qu'avocate et activiste pour les droits humains, je travaille justement pour. Les violations qui avviennent, je voudrais parler des violations qui avviennent aujourd'hui jour en Yémen, surtout à partir de l'inizio de la guerre et come eh, e cosa significa per me impunità e eh, di cosa ha bisogno la società civile e la comunità internazionale per poter porre eh, la, per poter evidenziare queste violazioni e temer... mettere in evidenza queste violazioni e punire ceux qui eh, continuano di fare eh, de, 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 de continuer ces violations. Alors, la loi n'est pas respectée. Il y a différentes violations qui sont perpétrées, surtout, euh, par exemple, dans les prisons qui, sont, euh, qui impliquent toutes les parties euh, de la guerre. Euh, il y a même des violations et des abus qui sont faits contre les journalistes, les activistes. Donc, on utilise la loi au Yémen pour chercher à euh, aller contre les minorités religieuses, par exemple. Et donc, tout ceci se fait à cause de la guerre euh, et que et ces violations et ces abus sont perpétrés. Et euh, on a cherché donc à écrire, à demander. Euh, on a vu par exemple hier qu'un mannequin avait été emprisonné et accusé de euh, mort parce que pour son travail. Donc euh, il y a eu beaucoup de violations qui ont été perpétrées. Euh, au fil des années, euh, mais dans, il y en a au jour les jours contre les habitants, il y a, euh, 
des frappes qui font mourir les, les jeunes, les enfants, les, les femmes. Il y a beaucoup de réfugiés, beaucoup de déplacés qui sont euh, obligés de fuir de leur maison et qui ont des difficultés à obtenir euh, des ressources essentielles telles que la nourriture, l'eau, etc. Et donc, on entend plus. On entend tu l'italien? Mm. On entend plus. On a grande. Euh, une grande période. Euh, tout ceci a eu un grand impact et les ressources principales du Yémen euh, qui sont déjà réduites euh, ont un impact encore limité. Donc, il faut vraiment euh, faire en sorte de pouvoir aider les personnes qui luttent au jour les jours euh, contre ce type de de, 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 de groupes qui euh, amènent le, le, le pays dans une situation de violence extrême. Donc, il faut avant tout dénoncer. Et comment peut-on faire avant, avant on se baser sur le système de gouvernement? Mais de toute façon, le GCC a été annulé maintenant. Et donc, au Yémen, il y a beaucoup de défis et de difficultés qu'il faut relever. Euh, et nous, en tant qu'activistes, qu'est-ce qu'on est en train de faire? Alors, on essaie de rester neutre et de chercher à identifier les violations euh, au Yémen. On a besoin de support euh, à l'international pour pouvoir euh, euh, supporter et aider les organisations au niveau local et aller au-delà de cette situation. Malheureusement, nous, on n'a vraiment plus de presque. On n'a pas le même espoir, en tout cas, qu'on avait dans le passé, parce qu'on a vu que les lois ne sont pas appliquées comme c'était le cas dans le passé. Donc, pour nous, la tâche est vraiment difficile. Ça a, été, ça a provoqué des dégâts énormes et on a perdu tout espoir. Euh, donc, il y a, cela nous a découragés davantage et n'aide pas les personnes en détresse et les victimes à sortir de cette situation et à faire en sorte qu'on puisse vraiment se, euh, trouver une solution. Est pour, le Yémen est un, est un pays qui est encore plus fragile, plus faible, parce qu'il n'y a pas d'organisme en mesure d'évaluer euh, cette situation et de pouvoir euh, aller vers une solution. Donc, la, so la so société civile doit avoir une responsabilité morale et on a besoin de réformes aussi pour pouvoir supporter le peuple du Yémen et mettre l'attention sur les droits humains. Euh, on a respecté le mécanisme qui, était, qui avait été présenté par le, le groupe GCC parce qu'il nous a permis de bien comprendre ce qui était en train de se passer. Donc, au vu de ce qui est en train de se passer maintenant et au vu de tout ce qui avait été fait, on espère vraiment que les organisations internationales pourront nous aider et pourront euh, nous donner des aides pour euh, faire en sorte qu'on puisse faire ressurgir le GCC euh, et faire en sorte qu'il qu ait une signification plus importante dans l'activité euh, au niveau national pour pouvoir supporter les victimes et toutes les personnes qui sont en souffrance et en détresse. Merci beaucoup. Remind beaucoup Ouda de nous avoir rappelé ce qui s'était all the parties in conflict and how the international community is actually failing on Yemen, to failing to help Yemen, especially with decisions like the one to close down the group of eminent experts. So leaving Yemen without, leaving Yemen and leaving the organizations in Yemen with no international mechanism to, uh, to actually hold those perpetrators 
uh, into account for, for the human rights violations. Um, thank you for this. We will have the opportunity, of course, to discuss about the group of eminent experts as well with uh, uh, Mr. Jean Duby. Uh, but I would like to leave the floor now to Farian Sabahe, who we said is a journalist and, and wrote a number of books on Yemen. And uh, I would like to leave you the floor now. Thank you. Thank you, Donatella. Thank you, all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to join uh, this panel and uh, to meet uh, via Zoom uh, Professor Ellen uh, Lackner, whom I tried to uh, drag into a conversation on um, Clubhouse a few days ago, but it uh, didn't work out. So I'm glad she's here now. Um, the point on international accountability is uh, actually very, very interesting because sanctions so far uh, by the UN Security Council targeted only the Houthis. And the Houthis uh, are uh, perceived as the bad guys in the world, but actually all uh, parts uh, involved uh, must uh, be uh, accountable for the human rights violations in the country. And uh, I personally think that the UN, uh, uh, the United Nations is not really doing uh, a good job uh, in uh, the war. And I experienced that myself uh, in uh, 2018 because I gathered uh, with uh, friends uh, in Italy and in Switzerland some 45,000 Swiss francs to buy cholera kits. And uh, the problem was uh, how to send the kits over to Yemen because of the Saudi, uh, the blockade imposed by the Saudi coalition. So I got in touch with the United Nations and I was told to uh, send uh, uh, everything by plane. Uh, and the plane costed some 18,000. Uh, Swiss francs to Djibouti. And from there, the United Nations were supposed to send them over to Yemen. And just uh, you know, a few hours before sending them off, I said, okay, where, where are you going to send uh, all the cholera kids? And I said, oh, uh, would you, what do you mean? Yeah, I would like to know in which governor's rates you are going to send them. And they sent me the list and they checked uh, where the cholera kids were going to. And they were actually going to the Saudi, to the areas controlled by the Saudi-led coalition. So the point is, uh, I'm gathering money to buy cholera kits and to fight the cholera epidemic in the country. And the cholera epidemic is due to the fact that the Saudi-led coalition cut electricity and water uh, in so many parts of the country. And I'm giving the cholera kits to those who caused the, the pandemic. So it didn't really make sense. So I stopped uh, the shipment and I waited for an NGO to send them straight to the areas where uh, there was a real need of uh, the cholera kit. So I was really puzzled by the fact that uh, the United Nations were sending the materials to those who caused the pandemic. So I think that's uh, uh, really makes no sense. Um, a question which has to be posed is why did the Uthis uh, move down to the capital city, Sana, uh, in September 2014? And why did they march? Uh, why, did they, why did they say why did they want to, keep, to um, uh, take power in the country? First of all, uh, my diplomatic sources uh, uh, my sources say that the Iranian authorities actually did not want the Houthis to take uh, over the capital Sana because uh, it was uh, it was going to be too complicated to keep control of such a country, uh, which is complicated. It's complex because of the tribal organization of the society. Not even President Ali Abdullah Saleh was in full control of the country. But the reason behind the fact that Duth is moved down from north, from the far north uh, Sada region to uh, the capital was that uh, uh, they couldn't tolerate anymore the strategy of imposed poverty. Um, so what I learned by talking to diplomats or talking to the people in Yemen was that uh, uh, for 40 years, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, kept uh, the far north region of Sada without uh, the infrastructures needed to develop. 
So there were no paved roads, there were no uh, schools, hospitals, and all the infrastructures you expect uh, um, in a part of the country. And in a way, uh, I've been told that uh, Ali Abdallah Saleh feared uh, the Houthis. And at the same time, since the Uthi are based in the north of Yemen, not far from the border with uh, Saudi Arabia, um, there have been infiltration of Salafi preachers uh, in that area. And uh, as you know, the Salafi have uh, a doctrine which is very far from the Zaidi, from the Shia doctrine of uh, the uh, of the Uthis. And uh, another point which I think is interesting is why did the Saudis decide to bomb uh, Yemen uh, in uh, uh, the night between the 25th and the 26th of March 2015? And as far as I can understand, the Saudis uh, cannot tolerate a Shia minority in the Arabian Peninsula to take power because it will give uh, a bad example to um, all Shia minorities of the Arabian Peninsula because 15% uh, uh, of the Saudi population professes Shia Islam. They are mainly based uh, in uh, the Al-Khatif region, the Eastern region of uh, Saudi Arabia, which is by the way, the richest in oil. And for this reason, the Saudis uh, actually uh, intervened uh, with tanks, military in uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, I think it was uh, the 14th, of February uh, 2011. So when they entered uh, Bahrain, they entered in uh, Perth Square in Manama. So uh, that's another point. So it's, um, uh, then we have been told it's a proxy war. Of course, uh, uh, there's uh, there, what was at the beginning a civil war developed into a regional and international uh, war. And the position of an international community is uh, mainly due to the fact that uh, selling arms uh, to Saudi Arabia, to the Emirates, uh, gives uh, an enormous uh, push to the economy. And I'm thinking of the economy of the United States, for instance. I wrote down in the preface of my book that uh, uh, the contract uh, signed with Mantec International, uh, which is a, an American company uh, selling arms and producing arms in Fairfax, Virginia, for uh, keeping the F-15 is valued at $175 million. And uh, the sales of arms done by Boeing and Traxton uh, is done directly by the US government, which gets a commission of 7%, which goes to finance other initiatives uh, in uh, the international arena. So there is a direct gain also by governments when, in this case, by the US government, when the US government sells arms. And uh, we saw it last week, uh, Joe Biden signed a contract uh, allowed uh, the contract for $500 million uh, for the sale of arms. So this, uh, um, the selling of arms is going, uh, is going on. There is another organization campaign against arms trade. And according to this organization, the UK sold uh, um, 6.5 billion uh, pounds uh, for arms uh, which are used uh, in, um, in the war in Yemen. And to say at the same time, the UK um, helped Yemen with uh, a tau, uh, one billion uh, pounds in humanitarian uh, assistance. So on one, in one way, Europe gives assistance and the, on the other way, European countries allow their uh, arms company to sell arms which are used uh, in Yemen. So it doesn't really make sense that we uh, taxpayers of the United of the European Union keep on paying for uh, this war to go on. Um, who is paying the price? Of course, the population. We have 3.5 um, IDPs, uh, and as uh, uh, Radia said before. Uh, no, there is no Yemeni diaspora in Europe. 
And that's mainly due to the fact there is a blockade. So we don't see um, refugees coming from Yemen because uh, these people cannot leave their country. They cannot fly, they cannot uh, uh, even Keep bringing aid in Yemen is extremely complicated, as I mentioned before, uh, when I referred to the cholera kids. At the very beginning of, uh, uh, of the Mansur Hadi era, um, uh, we actually had uh, um, hope also when uh, it came to women's rights and to the rights of girls because uh, the women who were in uh, the dialogue, dialogue for the um, uh, Conferenza del Dialogo Nazionale, I'm sorry, I'm mixing my languages, the Conference for the National Dialogue, were actually putting forward uh, um, laws to um, keep the age at 18 to get married and uh, to uh, give more rights to women and girls. And with the war, uh, all these uh, uh, actually stopped. There is a, an interesting, uh, um, an interesting uh, report which uh, I read uh, uh, this morning. Is um, maybe you already know, know are, you are already aware of it. It was published on October twenty seventh by the Sana uh, Center for Strategic Studies. It's called uh, "Challenging the Narratives: Is Yemen Really the Worst Humanitarian Crisis in the World?" And I think it's interesting because it sets out uh, data. Uh, it's a comparative report with South Sudan, Syria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, and Yemen. And it sets out the number of civilian deaths in conflict. Um, it says there was uh, so much violence before, so before the war, uh, because of land and water uh, disputes. And uh, then there's, um, again, a... Uh, um, uh, there are data on uh, food insecurity in uh, the country. So I may be, I might be able to uh, share it on, uh, on the chat if you wish. But I think that the main issue the, on which we can work is uh, accountability and uh, the arms industry. And uh, maybe writing articles, uh, but it's so hard to get an article published on Yemen. I see, I, I normally write for the Italian press and every time I post an article in Yemen, you know, it's uh, just so bizarre, so far away. And with the COVID-19 pandemic in Europe, it's even worse. So there is no space on the pages of foreign affairs, but the pressure we can make is uh, on the fact that uh, European countries uh, make money out of the war. And then uh, as a taxpayers, uh, part of what we pay goes into humanitarian aid in uh, Yemen. So it really makes no sense. In a way, we are all responsible for what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Farian. Uh, thank you for, again, reminding the issue of accountability, but also reminding how, how basically the international community and European, uh, European states are basically what they give with one hand, giving help, you know, and a humanitarian help with uh, aid with one hand, then they take it away with the other, other hand because they allow uh, weapons, industries of weapons to basically sell weapons uh, in Yemen for the war. So this is also the, the, the paradox of the situation on how, again, the international community is failing to um, help Yemen uh, and Yemeni people. Uh, thank you for uh, the um, uh, intervention so far on the context. We will go, now we will move to uh, representatives of international institutions. Before moving to that, I would like to just inform the participants that uh, Helen Lochner, Lochner had to leave, as she mentioned, um, uh, but I would like to um, mention that she wrote um, the book Yemen in Crisis, The Road to War, which is the new version published in 2019 as a, as a new version uh, of the book Yemen in Crisis, in, uh, in Crisis, Autocracy, Neoliberalism and the Disintegration of a State published in 2017. So as you can see, we have a number of speakers today who have actually written and published books on the war in Yemen. And if you're interested, 
um, of course, you will be able to read them and learn more about the war in Yemen and international responsibility in the war in Yemen. Speaking about international actors, um, I would like to leave the floor to Mr. Jean Duby, who is the chair of the UN Group of Eminent International and Regional Experts on Yemen that we spoke about, uh, the group that has been basically now uh, closed down and finished. And uh, uh, Mr. Jean Duby, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup euh, pour votre invitation. Je vais essayer d'être euh, le plus bref possible. Euh, tout d'abord, permettez-moi de faire une petite observation préliminaire sur, euh, relative peut-être aux origines, aux causes du conflit au Yémen. Euh, en écho à ce que Hélène avait dit, je pense qu'il faudrait rajouter trois facteurs qui me semblent être à l'origine de cette crise. Tout d'abord, la faiblesse institutionnelle de l'État yéménite le fait que l'État soit est un facteur euh, aggravant des violations des droits de l'homme. L'autre aspect qui a caractérisé le Yémen, qui était source aussi de conflit, c'est la monopolisation du pouvoir par euh, partie des ménites, on dépend souvent de notre partie, ici de l'histoire du Yémen. Et puis la troisième cause, c'est effectivement une longue histoire de violation, une longue histoire d'impunité qui a caractérisé l'histoire du Yémen euh, récente, etc. Comme vous le savez, j'ai eu l'honneur de présider pendant quatre ans un groupe d'éminents experts internationaux et régionaux relatifs au Yémen. Nous avons déjà publié quatre rapports, je ne vais pas les citer, vous le savez, mais simplement pour souligner que euh, s'agissant de la lutte contre l'impunité et de la responsabilisation, nous avons par exemple, euh, le, dans notre dernier rapport, à, à, à ajouter une annexe importante sur la situation de la justice yéménite, car il faudrait faire le diagnostic de ce qui existe au Yémen pour pouvoir ensuite justifier d'une manière argumentée la nécessité de l'existence d'un mécanisme international, euh, évidemment. Et nous avons aussi fait quelques propositions, ce n'est pas la peine de les rappeler, mais juste euh, au niveau international pour, pour dire que… Je ne peux pas vraiment aller dans les détails, mais… Les recommandations, notamment… Les requêtes intermédiaires. L'homme dans son agenda, qu'il élargisse la liste des personnes susceptibles d'être sanctionnées par les violations. La liste existante actuellement, elle est très sélective, elle ne concerne qu'une partie du conflit, pas toutes les parties du conflit. De la même manière, effectivement, on a suggéré la nécessité d'un mécanisme international d'enquête criminelle similaire à ce qui existait pour la Syrie ou pour la Birmanie, ou encore à plus long terme, un tribunal hybride impliquant euh, donc à la fois la communauté internationale et les autorités yéménites. Évidemment, euh, ce que je peux dire, euh, observer rapidement, après, euh, après le vote négatif du Conseil de sécurité, que vous le, euh, le Conseil des droits de l'homme, comme vous le savez, euh, le vote euh, a été pour euh, l'arrêt de cette, euh, cette mission, de cette, de cette mission d'investigation. Euh, donc, on peut dire qu'effectivement, maintenant, le poids, euh, le poids de la responsabilité pour faire face à l'absence de responsabilité et de face à la liberté, se trouve sur le dos de la société civile que je salue. Je salue leur courage, je salue leur abnégation, je salue aussi leur investissement et parfois qui peuvent leur coûter cher. Et je parle de la société civile yéménite, bien sûr, mais je parle aussi de la société civile internationale qui aussi joue un rôle important et votre organisation certainement aura une contribution qualitative à le faire dans ce domaine. Alors, j'aimerais bien centrer ici, plutôt, j'espère ne pas être très long, sur, sur la lutte contre l'impunité, sur la thématique de, de votre conférence qui est relative à la lutte contre l'impunité et la justice transitionnelle. Euh, bien sûr, les différentes actions menées pour lutter contre l'impunité au Yémen sont louables toutes hein, et sont cruciales pour maintenir une, une certaine pression sur les auteurs de violations. À plus ou moins court terme, à mon avis, il faudra toutefois aborder la question de manière plus globale. En effet, il est important de glisser d'une responsabilisation d'opportunité vers une responsabilisation plus exhaustive. Toutes ces actions, aussi bénéfiques soient-elles, qu'elles soient menées au niveau international, par la société civile, etc., laissent à l'écart en fait, de vastes champs de violation et nombreux de leurs auteurs. Par exemple, les droits économiques, sociaux et culturels, par exemple. 
ne sont absolument pas pris en considération. Par ailleurs, la situation humanitaire décrite par les différents rapports, aussi bien des groupes BE ou la société civile, euh, est la cause de milliers de morts et de la souffrance de plusieurs millions de personnes, femmes, hommes, jeunes. Cette situation est le résultat, comme vous le savez, d'une combinaison de causes. On peut citer notamment, bien sûr, le blocus par la coalition des principaux aéroports et ports du Nord du pays, qui ont provoqué euh, une augmentation des prix de denrées. Le Yémen importe plus de 70 des denrées alimentaires consommées par les ménages et du prix de fuel, lequel provoque une réaction en chaîne sur les prix des biens de consommation courants ou des médicaments. À ceci s'ajoute la destruction des infrastructures civiles en violation des normes du droit international humanitaire, comme les sites agricoles, les bateaux de pêche, les moulins ainsi que les marchés, mais aussi les hôpitaux et autres centres médicaux, les canalisations d'eau, les puits, les camions, citernes et les infrastructures énergétiques. Euh, la majorité de ces destructions sont dues aux frappes de la coalition depuis 2015. C'est le cumul de toutes ces violations qui explique largement la situation humanitaire et le nombre croissant de personnes vivant dans des conditions proches de la famille. Dans notre rapport de 2019, nous avons mentionné que le fait, euh, le fait que les actes mentionnés aient contribué à priver la population de biens indispensables à sa survie et aient été commis de manière continue fait craindre vivement que la famine ait pu être utilisée comme une méthode de guerre par toutes les parties au conflit. Or, Soumettre la population à de telles privations constitue en outre un traitement inhumain proscrit, ces actes étant considérés comme des violations graves du droit international humanitaire et sont susceptibles d'engager les responsabilités pénales et des responsables pour crimes de guerre. Au vu de la gravité des faits, il est donc important de mettre en place un processus beaucoup plus global pour reprendre aux demandes des victimes, qui ne sont pas uniquement d'ordre judiciaire. Cela passera par l'établissement de mécanismes de responsabilité et de réparation dans le cadre d'un plan, comme vous l'avez souligné vous-même, de justice transitionnelle plus générale. Quoi qu'il advienne, le Yémen, comme partout ailleurs, se posera le dilemme de la paix contre la responsabilité. En effet, beaucoup continuent de considérer qu'il ne peut pas y avoir de paix si l'on aborde concomitamment la responsabilité pour l'évaluation des droits de l'homme et des droits internationaux humanitaires. Mais dans l'histoire récente du Yémen, il ne faut pas l'oublier, peu de temps après la signature de l'initiative du Conseil de coopération du Golfe le 23 novembre 2011, euh, il a été organisé une conférence de dialogue national, a été adoptée une loi sur l'humanité en 2012, et cette loi a protégé l'ancien président yéménite et ses collaborateurs des poursuites judiciaires pour les crimes commis pendant ces 3, 33 ans de pouvoir. Euh, la réussite d'un plan de justice transitionnelle dépendra bien sûr de différents facteurs. Il faudra notamment que ce soit un processus qui soit initié et mené par les Yéménites eux-mêmes, avec un rôle important de la société civile dans toutes ses composantes et soutenue par la communauté internationale. Euh, je voudrais conclure par ces mots, c'est qu'après sept ans de guerre, il est devenu impérieux de trouver une solution pacifique à ce conflit. Les derniers événements, certes, nous laisse, nous laisse perplexe, notamment à ce qui se passe à, à Mahal euh, et, la, et le conflit, la persistance du conflit. Mais d'un autre côté, il me semble que le souhait visible des États-Unis euh, pourrait jouer un rôle important dans le conflit et pourrait permettre d'opérer euh, un changement de politique étrangère au Yémen et dans la région. Quoi qu'il advienne, le sort, euh, ce qui doit nous motiver en tout cas, c'est le sort des civils. C'est dans son contexte que les actions en vue de terminer la responsabilité du regard aux violations de droits de l'homme prennent toute leur valeur. Il est pourtant évident que les initiatives pour combattre l'impunité qui ont été mises en place jusqu'à maintenant sont louables, mais très, très, très insuffisantes. Il faudra bien plus que, euh, pour que les victimes obtiennent réparation et pour que l'UMN puisse aspirer à une plus durable. Les négociations de paix doivent prendre en considération la question de l'impunité en incluant les bases pour une justice de transition qui est seule à pouvoir rendre la plus durable. La guerre ne cessera pas avec la fin des hostilités. Il faudra penser les plaies et cela devra se faire au moyen d'un programme ambitieux de justice qui ne se limite pas à la dernière phase du conflit armé qui a débuté en mars 2014.
voilà un petit peu les quelques idées que j'ai voulu poser dans cette conférence. Et je crois que, sans insister trop, faire appel, qui sont reprises de, en fait, de, de, de nos rapports que nous avons écrits ces quatre dernières années. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, M. Jean Duby, et merci parce que c'est vrai que vos propos sont inclus dans vos rapports, mais c'était très intéressant aujourd'hui, je pense, de mettre l'accent et l'importance sur le fait qu'on laisse les ONG yéménites et internationales, mais surtout les yéménites, travailler toutes seules, parce que finalement, si on, a, si on abolit, si on ferme tous les, 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 les mécanismes internationaux, on laisse les ONG yéménites travailler seules, dans un contexte où il n'y a pas de, de processus de justice traditionnelle, comme vous l'avez dit. Et donc, l'importance et l'accent que vous mettez sur un processus, sur le besoin d'un processus de justice traditionnelle qui part des Yéménites, évidemment, eux-mêmes, qui soit un, un, un processus qui peut amener seulement avec ça à la paix. Et comme vous l'avez dit, il ne peut, peut pas y avoir de paix si on ne reconnaît pas les responsabilités dans un contexte pareil. Donc, merci d'avoir soulevé, d'avoir mis l'accent sur toutes ces, euh, ces thématiques-là. Donc, euh, comme on dit en anglais, last but not least, <rire> donc notre, notre dernier euh, intervenant est M. Tarabella, qui est membre du, du Parlement européen, euh, et donc qui nous parlera aussi euh, du travail du Parlement européen sur la question de la, du conflit au Yémen. Merci, M. Tarabella. À vous la parole. Tout d'abord, je tiens à remercier Fight Against Impunity pour l'organisation de cette rencontre, en particulier son président Pierre Antonio Panzeri, mon ex-collègue que j'ai beaucoup de plaisir à recroiser aujourd'hui, même si ce n'est pas physiquement. Dans ces discussions qui ne sont apparemment pas produites de résultats concrets, euh, j'ai écouté attentivement tous les témoignages évidemment et qui sont concomitants et concordants et en temps réalité ce, ces discussions ont un grand intérêt de retenir l'attention soutenue en tout cas de l'opinion au, au sein du Parlement une attention soutenue depuis, depuis des années qui font en sorte que notre engagement euh, afin d'aider à résoudre euh, ce conflit est devenu aujourd'hui euh, ce conflit d'ailleurs qui a produit la plus grande crise humanitaire de l'histoire moderne euh, et je, vais, je vais avoir l'occasion de, de détailler sans entrer trop dans le détail, le temps nous est compté, mais euh, le Parlement, depuis certains temps, a accordé une attention particulière. Alors, peut-être quelques chiffres, au risque de répéter ce qui a peut-être été dit ça et là, et sans entrer dans le détail, mais la plus grosse crise humanitaire, parce qu'aujourd'hui, il est coutume de dire que plus de 20 millions d'Yéménites ont besoin de l'aide internationale euh, d'urgence, l'aide humanitaire pour survivre, ces deux tiers de la population et dont plusieurs millions d'enfants. 4 millions de personnes déplacées à l'intérieur du pays, plus de 140 000 réfugiés, notamment principalement en Somalie ou en Éthiopie. Ben, C'est clair que euh, ces chiffres parlent d'eux-mêmes. Le pays compte actuellement la quatrième plus grande population de déplacés internes au monde euh, en raison du conflit. Alors, ces affrontements qui, qui font rage euh, et continuent de détériorer l'espace de protection des civils et obligent des, des milliers de familles à chercher refuge ailleurs. Plus de 50 lignes de actives de front à travers le pays qui a obligé plus de 67 000 personnes à être déplacées de force cette année, en particulier dans le gouvernorat de Marib. Alors, dans tout le pays, en plus, l'économie s'est effondrée. M. Djedoubi a, a bien fait d'insister sur le, le pilonnage des infrastructures utiles à la population euh, par les, euh, la coalition menée par l'Arabie saoudite et qui font que la situation euh, est évidemment euh, déplorable. Je souligne en plus que, effectivement, le, le Rial Yéménite a, dé, a une dévaluation permanente, ce qui fait qu'évidemment, la population euh, est précipitée sous le seuil de pauvreté, de facto, par cette inflation galopante, mais qui résume aussi de, de toute la crise euh, qui vient d'être décrite. La malnutrition, une grande partie de la population souffrant de malnutrition, euh, est évidemment quelque chose qui nous a beaucoup préoccupés. Il existe aussi un manque d'accès à l'assistance médicale, à l'assainissement et, et à la nourriture. Et la pandémie de Covid-19 n'a fait qu'aggraver une situation qui était déjà critique. Alors, les groupes vulnérables, les femmes, les jeunes filles, les personnes handicapées et les réfugiés sont de plus en plus touchés par ce conflit en cours, souvent confrontés à des abus et à l'exploitation de toutes sortes. Alors, la position actuelle de l'Union européenne, c'est vrai que l'Union européenne soutient la médiation menée par l'ONU en vue d'une solution politique au conflit, que le 18 février 2019, le Conseil de l'Union européenne a adopté des conclusions sur le Yémen réaffirmant son attachement à l'unité, la souveraineté, l'indépendance et l'intégrité du territoire du Yémen, 
que l'Union européenne soutient l'accord de Stockholm conclu entre les représentants des partis yéménites sous les auspices des Nations unies, c'était en décembre 2018, et le processus politique euh, dirigé par les Nations unies euh, en vue de mettre fin au conflit et de favoriser un environnement régional plus stable. Je tiens également à rappeler le fait que les Nations unies soutiennent de la délégation parlementaire du pays du Golfe. En 2020, dans le cadre de la 75e Assemblée générale des Nations unies, avec les ministres et les représentants des, des États-Unis, de la Chine, de la France, de la Russie et le haut représentant de l'Union européenne, Joseph Borrell, pour discuter du besoin urgent de progrès politique au sein au Yémen. Et malgré toutes ces initiatives, le processus de paix n'a pas encore progressé de manière significative et vos témoignages ne font que le corroborer. Alors, quel a été le rôle spécifique du Parlement européen dans cette histoire ben, D'abord, on a adopté plusieurs résolutions, sous l'égide d'ailleurs de notre sous-commission droit, droits humains, mais je dirais que ce sont des résolutions qui ont été votées par l'entièreté du Parlement européen, et je vais y revenir. Des résolutions qui ont été prises dès juillet 2015, février 2016, juin 2017, novembre 2017 et octobre 2018. Notamment le 13 septembre 2017, le Parlement a également adopté une résolution sur les exportations d'armes qui déplore le fait que la technologie militaire exportée par les États membres soit utilisée dans le conflit au Yémen. Et plus récemment, c'était le 11 février 2021, donc il y a quelques mois, le Parlement a aussi adopté une large majorité. Alors pensez, la large majorité, c'est quoi 694 des 705 députés ont voté, c'est-à-dire qu'il n'y a que 11 députés qui n'ont pas voté. Sur les 694 députés du Parlement européen, 638 ont voté en faveur de la résolution. Il y a eu 12 qui ont voté contre et 44 abstentions. Ça veut dire 638, c'est une écrasante majorité du Parlement européen qui a voté cette résolution et sur la situation humanitaire et politique au Yémen, regrettant profondément évidemment la crise humanitaire qui se déroule dans le pays, appelé à l'instauration d'un cessez-le-feu, à l'interdiction de l'exportation d'armes vers des États tiers impliqués dans le conflit. C'était notamment un des paragraphes importants, c'était les 12 et 13, s'il y a parmi vous qui ont la résolution, sinon je veux bien la transmettre via l'organisation pour que vous ayez cette résolution dans la langue qui vous convient. Mais très clairement, c'était assez fort comme résolution, notamment par cet aspect qui a été évoqué, l'exportation d'armes. L'Union européenne est également active au niveau local. La délégation de l'Union européenne au Yémen, qui opère actuellement à partir d'Aman en Jordanie, a financé des actions liées au soutien du dialogue informel au niveau national par le biais de l'instrument contribuant à la stabilité et à la paix. Et en outre, l'Union a mené des projets dans le cadre de son appui au processus de paix pour le Yémen. Alors, en termes d'aide humanitaire, effectivement, ça a été dit, et c'est vrai qu'il y a le paradoxe avec les livraisons d'armes, mais je vais y revenir, euh, mais pour, pour faire face à la situation dramatique dans le pays, plus de 80% de la population a besoin d'une aide humanitaire, et l'Union avait donc dégagé en tout 554 millions d'euros d'aide humanitaire au Yémen depuis 2015. À ça s'ajoute 318 millions d'euros d'aide à court terme, alors, à long terme, pardon, que l'Union européenne a fourni jusqu'à présent, la contribution globale de l'Union européenne dans tous les domaines d'aide a dépassé le milliard d'euros depuis 2015. C'est vrai que ce n'est pas rien, mais cet engagement a été encore renforcé en 2019 lorsque l'Union européenne a renforcé son engagement humanitaire avec une contribution supplémentaire de 80 millions d'euros, apportant la dotation totale de l'année à 115 millions d'euros. L'Union s'est aussi engagée à, à tripler l'aide alimentaire en, en 2021, l'aide humanitaire en tout cas, euh, et à poursuivre ses efforts. Alors C'est vrai qu'il y a des inquiétudes grandissantes qui concernent l'épidémie de coronavirus dans le pays, déchirée par la guerre. L'Union a également financé des mesures d'urgence visant à réduire l'impact de la pandémie au Yémen avec un total de 70 millions d'euros. En guise de, de conclusion euh, par rapport à cela, il existe deux éléments fondamentaux de l'action de l'Union à, à l'égard. C'est l'allocation d'énormes ressources économiques pour l'aide unilatérale et la pression constante et continue sur les partis à la cause qui rend le meilleur parti de son pouvoir de persuasion, pour autant que de persuasion, on va dire morale, notamment sur certaines lignes directrices identifiées dans les 27 recommandations d'une résolution la plus récente qui fut adoptée en février. Je ne vais pas les citer toutes les 27, on n'a pas le temps, mais il y en a quelques-unes qui sont très fortes. 
et un soutien aux efforts de l'envoyé spécial du secrétaire général des Nations Unies pour les humains, Martin Griffiths, mais aussi le soutien à la lutte, je l'ai dit, contre l'impunité des crimes de guerre, des crimes contre l'humanité, des violations flagrantes des droits de l'homme. C'est le chapitre 27, le paragraphe 27, qui était très clair. Malheureusement, en parenthèse, le Parlement européen n'a pas la compétence de sanctionner les responsables et, de, et, et, et finalement de contrecarrer leur impunité apparente pour l'instant. Nous ne faisons que suggérer. Le vrai pouvoir, c'est le Conseil, c'est les gouvernements. C'est la même chose pour les armes. Quand je vous dis qu'il y a un soutien aux États membres pour évaluer une interdiction des exportations d'armes à destination de l'Arabie saoudite, les Émirats arabes unis, mais c'était aussi le Bahreïn et l'Égypte, les membres de la coalition, dans la résolution, on s'est mis en toutes lettres, chapitres et paragraphes 12 et 13. Mais on se, loge, on se heurte à la logique d'État membres. Certains sont d'accord, d'autres veulent continuer euh, leur business un peu à la, à la manière des États-Unis. Il y a eu la condamnation des dégâts causés au patrimoine culturel yéménite et les frappes aériennes, ça, les frappes aériennes, ça a été aussi mentionné. La relance d'un recours pressant à mettre fin à toutes les formes de violences sexuelles et sexistes à l'égard des, des femmes et des filles, y compris celles qui sont en détention. La condamnation des violations de la liberté d'expression, y compris la détention, la disparition forcée et l'intimidation des journalistes. Et enfin, j'en passe plein d'autres, mais il y a la protection des enfants afin de garantir qu'ils suivent pleinement de leurs droits fondamentaux, puisque eux aussi souffrent de malnutrition, il y en a quelques millions. Bref, les chiffres significatifs, euh, bon, je ne vais pas y revenir dessus, vous les connaissez tous. Mais donc, en conclusion, je dirais que le Parlement je pense, a fait son job dans la limite de son pouvoir dénoncer les choses, a obtenu, et c'est assez unique, mais la crise humanitaire est sans doute, et on a bien vu que la planète connaît aujourd'hui, et c'est fait en sorte que, de manière un peu étonnante dans ce type de dossier, il y a une large majorité qui s'est déclarée vraiment indignée de la situation. Bon, c'est vrai qu'au Parlement, ce pouvoir d'indignation existe, je dis malheureusement, le pouvoir, peut-être dans ce domaine, on voudra avoir plus de pouvoirs euh, qui sont généralement entre les mains du Conseil, donc de, des gouvernements européens, en espérant qu'ils puissent quand même euh, tout doucement changer d'attitude, avoir une attitude qui se durcisse euh, par rapport à, à la coalition qui a réduit la population dans cet état de pauvreté au Yémen et cette, de causer cette plus grande crise humanitaire que la planète connaît aujourd'hui. Euh, monsieur euh, Tarabella, un grand merci pour euh, votre intervention, pour euh, nous avoir euh, rappelé bah, le, le rôle de l'Union européenne, déjà euh, le, le, le travail important que le Parlement européen a fait depuis 2015 avec toutes les résolutions, et je dirais euh, une plus forte que l'autre à chaque fois, et surtout l'importance d'avoir euh, appelé les États membres de l'Union européenne à une interdiction de vente d'armes dans un conflit, que, comme nous l'avons vu, euh, et vous avez donné aussi certains numéros, euh, certains, certaines statistiques de nombre de déplacés internes, nombre de victimes, la famine, je, le, le, le monsieur Jean Douy l'avait aussi dit, non la famine utilisée comme arme de guerre aussi. Donc, euh, voilà, dans ce contexte très important, euh, euh, merci de nous, nous avoir rappelé tout ça. Avant euh, de laisser l'espace à quelques questions, parce que nous n'avons pas énormément de temps, euh, et avant de laisser euh, la parole pour la conclusion à Pierre-Antonio Panzeri, le président de Fighting Punity. Je voudrais juste pour un petit point laisser la parole à Farian Sarahi parce qu'elle euh, voulait ajouter un tout petit point et puis on continuera de là. Donc Farian, si tu es là, euh, je te laisse la parole pour un bref point. Merci. Um, yes, I, I personally think that we have to... To take, to take, oh, sorry, I'm just, uh, I hear my own translation. I think that we have to uh, recognize that the people who are responsible for the war uh, are not uh, the Yemeni people, are actually the Saudis who gathered um, a Sunni coalition and started bombing the country. And uh, with the aid of the US, uh, the aid of the UK, and the aid of uh, France, these are the main three countries involved. And uh, uh, it's important to make clear that the responsibility uh, of the war is uh, upon the Saudi-led coalition, who bombed regularly uh, civil uh, neighborhoods, meaning uh, areas where the population lives, 
uh, they bombed the uh, schools and the day after they, bo they bombed the hospitals where the kids were taken with injuries. They bombed uh, school buses and they bombed the monuments of Yemen as well. So the aim of the Saudi-led coalition has been not only to uh, kill the population of Yemen, but also to destroy the Yemeni's uh, cultural heritage and identity. And I think that's a point which you should, we should really make, uh, make clear. Uh, at the moment, 75% 70, of the Yemeni population lives in areas controlled by the Houthis. Um, for the South, it's very hard to um, leave the country because that will be a mean to recognize uh, defeat. Um, but again, uh, the Sense of Frontiera and uh, the few organizations, NGOs who are present in the country fully recognize that uh, the Saudis have been, uh, you know, bombing the population. And in a way, the Houthis is uh, uh, a resistance movement, uh, which has uh, many um, many problems itself. And I have uh, the media platform open here, multimedia news browser. And uh, as Huda mentioned before, uh, Yemen's rebel Houthi movement has sentenced a model to five years in prison over drug abuse and prostitution, uh, charged, uh, charges which were rejected by her defense and condemned by rights groups. The name of this girl is Intisar al Hamadi, 20. She was arrested in February at the checkpoint while on her way to a photo shoot uh, in the capital, Sana. So the Uthis uh, are uh, to have to be, uh, must be accountable for human rights violations as well. But uh, what the Saudi led coalition has been doing in the last uh, seven years is a massive violation of human rights, not only on the population, but again, they bombed with their uh, intelligent bombs, um, monuments and museums in the country, which really makes no sense. And the only explanation is uh, the need, the aim to uh, destroy the cultural identity of yes. uh, the people of Yemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Farian, for pointing all these uh, details also. Um, so, um, I don't see any questions, but I would like to ask if there is any questions from the participants. This is the moment for you to raise the questions. Um, so, there is the Q&A uh, session here the Q&A button. So if you have any questions, please write them there. Um, but do it now because we're not going to uh, put, to ex ex expand this uh, the time too much. So if there is any question, please do it now. Meanwhile, I would like to just remind you that uh, Fight Impunity has a report that is coming out tomorrow on the role of the European Union um, between the quest for accountability and providing weapons impunity in Yemen. That's uh, basically the whole, the, the theme of the conference today. And um, in our report, uh, we raise uh, certain recommendations which are meant to be in support of Yemeni civil society and the ex exceptional work that Yemeni human rights uh, NGOs are doing. Um, the first uh, recommendation is to push the UN Security Council to refer the situation in Yemen to international criminal courts and to also expand the list of persons subject to Security Council sanctions, uh, uh, which is very important. Then to participate in the international debate over the possibility of setting up a specialized court to deal with the international crimes committed during the seven years of conflict in Yemen, to call on its member states to stop the trade of arms and weapons to parties to the conflict and thus contribute to a lasting and sustainable peace in Yemen, and keep supporting the work of Yemeni civil society organizations, 
both financially and by ensuring also their protection and safety while they are in process of investigating human rights violations. These are the recommendations that are included in the report Fight Impunity is publishing tomorrow. Uh, you can, you will have to, uh, you will find it on Fight Impunity uh, website. And uh, I will ask my colleagues to put the website of Fight Impunity in the, um, in the chat uh, so that everyone can see it. If there are no questions, because I don't see any questions, I would like to close, sorry. There is one. Yes, Huda, we are ready. Yes, Huda, please. I see, I see now that you raise your hand, please. شكرا جزيلا هو ليس سؤال وإنما إعطاء لمحة عن التوصية التي قرأت Euh, au, au Cairo Institute euh, et dans cette campagne on a euh, justement créé une liste de personnes qui sont corrompues euh, on a adressé une liste des personnes corrompues et on a écrit tout ceci sur, dans un site web dans lequel vous pouvez trouver le nom Euh, et les données de ces personnes qui ont perpétré ces violations, qui ont entraîné des souffrances en termes de population, tout en empêchant euh, d'avoir une stabilité du point de vue euh, des euh, conflits. Merci beaucoup. Uh, you can share, please write it on the chat and then uh, people will be able to access it. That's very, very important. Thank you very much for raising this and for pointing that out. Uh, so I would like to leave now okay. the floor for some for concluding words to the president of Fight Impunity, Pier Antonio Banzeri, um, to give, you know, to, to, to close this conference and to give your message. Thank you, Pier Antonio. Bene, grazie. Eh, grazie soprattutto per il lavoro che è stato svolto, lo dico a Donatella, e grazie anche per la vostra partecipazione. Per la partecipazione a questa iniziativa di Fight Impunity. Brevi parole. Giusto qualche mot. Volevo però subito dirvi che... Je voulais juste vous dire che... Il y a des difficultés, y a, donc, si les difficultés sont bien connues, euh, c'est vrai qu'il y a des difficultés ultérieures en considération, par exemple, de la pandémie euh, de COVID-19. The international um, public opinion is a little bit distracted. Some countries and governments have... Uh, uh, exploited this situation and they try to get away with their lack of respect of uh, human rights. There are uh, supranational uh, bodies that lost power and then there is an objective weakness of uh, civil uh, society and its organizations. But uh, we wanted to face the Yemeni issue because we think that this is the right moment to launch a stronger initiative. We believe that after years of conflict, Yemen is subject to a humanitarian healthcare, economic and political crisis that is unprecedented. And uh, you have talked about it. Um, from different points of view. There are so many big international responsibilities and there is no doubt, and I want to highlight this point, that Reis Almari and uh, his um, son will be rem remembered as uh, the people that destroyed their country. But there are also responsibilities in the coalition of the 
the um, the United Emirates. So I think that uh, in order to rebuild Yemen, the country will have to go through uh, very difficult years. And without uh, a specific uh, rebuilding project, what will happen is that a lot of Yemeni people will uh, lose their income and without having real alternatives that uh, may allow them to survive, well, local groups could consider the end of, uh, of the conflict not as something beneficial. So it is important to call uh, on the international organizations and those countries that can have an impact on the Yemeni uh, situation. I think that the United Nations should be sent a new international mandate that with, with political and economic goals. From a political point of view, Yemeni people should be encouraged to revitalize that historical moment from 2011, where all the uh, parties created democracy in the squares in different uh, towns in Yemen. And from an economic point of view, the international uh, society should start a process a long and difficult process towards a better situation. Of course, all of these must be carried out in agreement with the Yemeni civil society, and we would like to collaborate with them more closely, starting with the things that Huda mentioned in this conference. And of course, there's also the need to think about uh, the crimes that were perpetrated and their uh, responsibility. And I must say that uh, facing responsibility, we need to think about the International Criminal Court, and we believe that it's a very big mistake what uh, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations did. I think it was a very uh, mistake, a very big mistake when the mandate for the uh, group of experts was um, was uh, abolished or was ended. So I think it's important to talk about this issue and then to talk about the role of the European Union because uh, the European Union can facilitate the political debate and start an initiative both for uh, human rights and fight against impunity in order to put pressure on member states so that they stop selling weapons. Because it is also true that another initiative was already started, but not all member states stick to the guidelines that were given. The European Parliament, as uh, Mr. Tarabella was saying with the resolution from February, uh, well, talked about a process, a direction that we should take. And I can say that after almost one year, we should start the debate again within the Parliament with a new resolution in order to focus on three issues which are fundamental, a rebuilding process, accountability for the crimes perpetrated, and uh, work of supranational bodies about the decision of the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. So these are the objectives including uh, the ones that were uh, included in the report and that the Donatella summed up. Well, these are the goals of our work for the next few months. And I think that I was kind of, uh, I, I found hope in the words that uh, you 
you used. So we will start, uh, well, starting from tomorrow, we will work more closely with the civil society and organizations uh, concerning Yemen. And uh, on an institutional level, we will try and put pressure on them because uh, on bodies because so we want to make sure that we can put all of this into practice so thank you so much for participating in this uh, important conference i will leave the floor to donatella alors avant de clôturer la conférence d'aujourd'hui et cette et cette thank you once again thank you so much thank you for the merci aussi les collègues de Fight Impunity qui ont permis l'organisation de la conférence aujourd'hui. Et donc, Giacomo, Simone et Julien, qui euh, sont ici avec moi dans la salle, mais que vous ne voyez pas, mais qui ont euh, beaucoup travaillé pour, euh, pour l'organisation de la conférence aujourd'hui. Et je voudrais remercier aussi les interprètes qui nous ont permis une communication facile entre différentes langues. Euh, donc, ça, effectivement, ça a été un énorme travail qui nous a aidés. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je vous laisse donc euh, aujourd'hui, euh, mais avec, comme le président de Fight Impunity le disait, avec euh, l'objectif de continuer à travailler ensemble, de continuer à discuter ensemble, mais, mais surtout de continuer à travailler ensemble pour que euh, la situation au Yémen puisse euh, se ressoudre, disons, pas seulement s'améliorer, parce qu'on est bien loin, mais euh, ce, de, de, que qu'on puisse bien travailler sur la solution de ce conflit et une paix durable. Je vous rappelle donc que sur le site de Fight Impunity, vous trouverez le travail en général que Fight Impunity fait sur la lutte contre l'impunité, la justice transitionnelle dans le monde et à partir de demain, en particulier, le rapport sur l'impunité au Yémen. Je vous remercie, je remercie toutes les personnes qui ont participé et je vous dis à presto, à bientôt et j'espère vous voir tous bientôt. Merci beaucoup.